on today's episode. You know him as Dwight from The Office, but he's here today as an existential badass and entrepreneur, Rain Wilson. How Rain turned his passion for inspiring others into a trailblazing new media empire. I'm hell bent on trying to kick the younger generation's ass to make any kind of a journey that questions the status quo. And how taking the biggest risk of his life set him on the path to success. You've got to have failures to learn from your failures. I'm never again going to try and be what anyone else wants me to be. That way is death. That's when doors started opening for me. It's time to go inside Quest with host Tom Bilyeu, president and co-founder of the second fastest growing private company in America. And now he's uncovering the universal principles of success. I can tell you right now what principle number one is, follow your passion. Inside Quest starts right now. Welcome to Inside Quest, everybody. We are the protein pancakes for the mind. Our goal is to bring on amazing people who can serve up answers to life's biggest questions. And if you're looking to chew on intellectual delights, there is no better guest than the man who's joining us today. You know him as Dwight from the smash hit show, The Office, but he's here today as an existential badass, humanitarian, and entrepreneur. This guy's accomplishments, seriously, they're freakish. They're way too numerous to cover, but to touch on just a few, He's been in countless hit movies, TV shows. He's been nominated for an Emmy multiple times, authored a New York Times best-selling book, <gasps> works with Oprah creating content that she refers to as pieces of light, co-founded soulpancake.com, one of the most authentic and successful new media companies in existence, and they already have hundreds of millions of views. And he once convinced Elon Musk to trade a Tesla for a bite of a chicken sandwich. <laughs> Not bad, if you ask me. Please help me in welcoming the wonderful, the wacky, and the completely original Rain Wilson. Thank you okay. so much. I, Tom, I want to stop the show right here because stop. that was the best introduction anyone has ever given me. Wow. And we should just quit right now. <laughs> Guys, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. The audience is so titillated by that. Um, I'll never be able to live up to that introduction. That was fantastic. Well, thank you. The irony is so, uh, really, the, the method that I use is very simple. I try to, to go inside. Well, first, we're really selective about who we bring on the show, because like you, we're mission-based. Um, so our goal is we really want people that can come and present information that will actually be useful, right? Not okay. just not just entertaining. We want it to be entertaining, but we don't want it to stop there. We want people that can really come on and inspire these people to action. Right. So we're, we're very careful. You and I have a mutual friend, and he said, look, the guy obviously is a prodigious talent from an entertainment standpoint, but what you don't yet know about him is there's a whole other side. Not only is he a successful entrepreneur, but he's very able to convey these difficult, slippery ideas. So I consider myself deeply spiritual, truly, but I always avoid that word because it gives me like the skeevies, like there's just something about the way it's morphed over time. Yeah. Um, but reading your book, Soul Pancake, learning why you guys called it Soul Pancake, there was every opportunity. If you, if you guys haven't read it, you gotta read the book. There's every opportunity to make a misstep, to make it cheesy, because they're really wrestling with the biggest questions we face as a society, as, as humanity. What happens when you die? What's the definition of truth? I mean, like really yeah. deep shit. Yeah. And you never slip into the cheesy, you never slip into the trite, but there's a sense of irreverence, mm -hmm. which makes it all the more poetic. And that was when I really realized that this could be a really cool episode, so. I'm truly grateful and I'm truly grateful for having gotten to spend the time climbing inside that world and really getting to see your content firsthand and, and all that. It's amazing. Nice. Why do you think though that um, spirituality has taken such an uncool turn? Well, I, I'm really glad that you brought that up first because it is, it's an, it's an icky word. I haven't personally found a better word to substitute for it, right. but when we were starting Soul Pancake, uh, some friends of mine and I, we wanted to do something really special on the web. We wanted to make something different and something positive, something that we would have loved when we were 19 years old and searching for the truth ourselves. And our lens into Soul Pancake was this idea of chew on life's big questions, that 
our biggest journey that all of us have is to find what is true for us and not to just accept the truth from our culture, not accept the truth from our parents, from our church, from our school, but to find what works for us and what's true for us. So spirituality is a key part of those life's big questions. It just is. Why spirituality sucks so much? Because it's been uh, <laughs> co-opted by two different groups. It either means fundamentalist religion, right. spirituality, which means church, or it means kind of a new age, airy, fairy, hippy dippy idea of like, you know, blending, merging chakras at a yoga class and a, with a candle and gazing into a crystal or something like that. And both of those things we at Soul Pancake really wanted to avoid, but say, let's, let's redefine our terms. So I recently had an idea about that. So here's how I would define spirituality me. So there's a whole bunch of things that human beings have in common with monkeys. There's a lot of things that we do the same as monkeys. We uh, enjoy bananas and um, we wrestle, we groom each other. We spend a lot of time on our hair. Um, we have a social hierarchy, we have a pecking order. We have tribes. We do the, we do the, we do the nasty, the nasty. Um, and sometimes when you're really, really mad, we throw our feces at, at people. Um, Just this last week. Yeah. You still haven't cleaned it up back there. Uh, so there's all these things that we have in common with monkeys. Right. Nothing wrong with these things per se. Spirituality, I would define as everything that we don't have in common with monkeys. So the ability to create beautiful works of art, to have conversations like this, to contemplate our lives, to ponder ourselves, to strive to live in service to other people. These are just some of the many things that we have separate from monkeys. So that's what I would qualify as spirituality. Yeah, I wish there was like the, the intellectual equivalent of a laugh track so people when, knew when they were hearing something profound. When you said, it was like the first idea that I encountered as I went into the rabbit hole that is your world. And I was like, that is one of the most profoundly eloquent and useful, and you'll learn about me, my thing is usability. If it's not mm -hmm. usable, right, so which assumes that you've got some goal that you're chasing after, which I do, and people that have watched the show have a rough sense of what that is. But it, it was so usable, and you talk about being action-oriented, but I thought it was really a beautiful way to say, hey, you see all these things that we have in common which acknowledge the human condition, but there is this level that we've managed to rise to mm -hmm. where there are these beautiful things about creating, sharing, connecting, yeah. And when I filtered that through my lens of what's usable, what's profound, um, how is that usable for us? And that that's the, the level of spirituality. And I didn't have the words and you gave them to me and I'm very grateful for that. But recognizing that that really is how I engage with spirituality. For me, this company, and you talked a lot about very eloquently about how artistic expression um, is a form of spirituality. And for me, doing a business artfully is a form, is a spiritual endeavor. And I've done businesses that were not, right? And that were completely devoid of that. And it was about chasing profit. And oddly enough, they were not very successful. And this comes down to why I think your definition is so usable. Once I realized spirituality is about playing on the level of the things we don't share with the monkeys. It's about connecting in that unique thing that makes us human, our desire to express and receive expression, to bond, to connect. Um, that's how we built the company, right? To, and we'll get to your uh, eudaimonia and the things that define that true human thriving. Um, and, and one of those is to, to serve others. And when, when you're doing that, when you're focused on serving others, even though I, I exist in a world where I'm trying to make money, like I don't make bones about that, right? There's a lot of power to that. There's a lot of utility. Uh, but doing it in a way that allows me to tap into that spirituality is, is incredibly important. Is that part of the reason? Because you're hell bent to bring spirituality to, uh, to anybody who will listen, obviously, but specifically to the younger generation. Is that? Yeah, I, I would say I'm not, I'm not hell bent to bring spirituality to a younger generation. I'm, I'm hell bent on trying to kick the younger generation's ass to, uh, to make any kind of a journey that questions the status quo. Why? Because the status quo, uh, the way that I see it in contemporary American culture, is a death trap and it's a dead end. 
it's materialistic, it's, uh, it's about status, it's about popularity. And, uh, and, and I don't disagree, but why is that bad? The ancient Greeks had a word for happiness that was a better word for happiness that is something that I spoke about at that talk that I gave at USC right. that you had watched. Um, and eudaimonia is the pursuit of human flourishing. So for humans to flourish beyond the realm of the monkey, that's where we need to be headed as a species. We need to put aside our pursuit for, of mindless, constant distraction, like the importance of sexuality and sexual conquest front and center, and put that on the side burner a little bit, and to live our lives in beautiful connection, making beautiful creations, and being in service to other people. But our culture doesn't want us there. Our culture wants us tuned out, distracted, cynical, and checked out. What you're doing on the show and what you're doing in your company is also, I would say, kicking young people's asses to take their own initiative and take their lives into their own hands. I'm coming at it from a little bit of a different angle, but I think we I both have, have the same mission. And I, and I actually agree with that very much. I have a very specific goal in mind for doing that. And I'm really curious to know what you see as your goal. So I get the, um, when you talk about the mission of engaging them in an active pursuit of spirituality, of actively asking and answering these profound questions, um, and that it will lead them to eudaimonia. Why does that matter? Is that the highest value to you? I think that's the greatest service that I could find for myself when I started to get famous for doing the office and we wanted to do something on the web. I found that I live my life in a daily meditation and contemplation and consultation with others and that's how I find my truth. That my greatest service that I could do for young people was to try and get them on this journey. An artistic journey, a spiritual journey, a journey towards service, towards connection and through life's big questions that we try and do on the Soul Pancake YouTube channel, right. that this was the greatest service that I could do. And so that's why I do it. Um, you really have to go watch the USC uh, speech that he gives. It was back in 2014, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and you define the difference between happiness, which you say uh, makes you a little bit sick, uh, and then eudaimonia and the difference, the sort of momentary nature of what people think is happiness. And one thing, and we've talked a lot about this as a company quest, we've talked a lot about it on the show. One of the things I find utterly fascinating is how people get confused by, because what they're gonna tell you, I've, I've interviewed now, it's gotta be close to 1200 people. Ask them, what do you want? Doesn't matter what uh, socioeconomic class they come from, everyone says I wanna be happy. Fantastic, what makes you happy? Very few people have an answer for that. Uh, and usually the answers they do have have to do with momentary happiness versus what you're calling eudaimonia. Um, so I'm gonna put words in your mouth here a little bit and you tell me if I'm right or wrong. Okay. So the for you, it's the highest service to get people to eudaimonia because that's really the true happiness that these people seek? Oh man, that's a tough one. Damn you. <laughs> Damn you, quest. <laughs> we need to go on a quest for eudaimonia. Um, I, uh, so I was put in a specific position at a specific point in time. Yeah. Cut to, cut back to seven years ago when we were starting Soul Pancake. The internet was a land of crap. Right. It was credit card scores right. and porn and chat rooms. That's what was on the web back then. There's so much more cool stuff nowadays. YouTube wasn't what it was, it wasn't Upworthy, there wasn't Buzzfeed, there wasn't Huffington Post, there wasn't sites of great beauty and utility like Instagram. There weren't these really great outlets for people back then. So we saw this opportunity and my, again, I thought that my mission the mission that I came up with that resonated in my heart and my soul that I wanted to do is I wanted to get young people talking about life's big ideas because I saw a lot of young people, frankly, sorry young people, I saw a lot of young people checked out of their lives and not actively engaged. You can call that spirituality, I do, but any journey that has to do with what feeds your soul, whether that's art, it's connection, it's love, it's, it's spreading joy, spreading inspiration, it's making the world a better place, it's uplifting other people's lives. It's really important to me and 
frankly, the way the world is right now, I think it's really important to the human race. It's interesting that you're prepared to think on that level. And, and obviously you had Elon Musk on your show, which we'll talk about in a minute because it was absolutely just a ball. I loved that episode. Uh, and how irreverent you get these people to be when you were slapping Uriah Faber, UFC all-star Uriah Faber in the back of the head and punching him <laughs> in the face, I might add. I thought, all right, this guy's got some cojones here. Um, but the reason that, that it resonates with me so much what you're trying to do and the reason that I see such a connection between your entrepreneurial journey and you know what you're calling a spiritual journey and uh, really focusing on the younger generation is, um, I'll use a business term, it's opportunity cost, right? And if you'll, will you indulge me for a minute? Please. All right, I'm going to be borderline sappy, but because this is all authentic, it's very real. It's how I think. Um, I am filled with a deep sadness when I see people that aren't living up to their potential. Now, that deep sadness is twofold. One, I'm just wired to be empathetic. Mm -hmm. I once threw an Easter egg hunt when I was five years old so that my sister would find more eggs than me because it was more important to her and I knew she'd be so happy. Um, and that's just sort of how I'm wired. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying it is. Mm -hmm. right? And then the other one is deeply selfish. I want to live in a world where there's Elon Musk's who are trying to go to Mars. I want to live in a world where someone creates a website called Soul Pancake because Spirit Taco was taken. Um, <laughs> I, I want to live in a world where people have the guts to say humanity needs this. Humanity needs to get off this planet. Humanity needs to really rethink about how it engages with itself. I just find myself compelled to go why right why does it matter and the why of that for me is the opportunity cost that i see in other people and then that selfish desire to want to see people do great things so it really does scare me that people can't engage in the questions that you're talking about you said you walk up to somebody and say uh hey what happens after life at a party and it's a conversation killer that shit scares me and it scares me because that means there's limits to what you're prepared to think yeah. about right mm -hmm. There's limits to what you're prepared that your answer may not be the right answer. And yeah. that's why I think that one in particular is a killer. It's an argument waiting to happen, right? I run a food company. I don't talk about food. If you corner me at a party, I am not going to talk to you about food. Why? You're going to get pissed. Like people are religious about this stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's in the book, Soul Pancake, they literally quote Bill Maher saying, my version of spirituality is the exact opposite of religion. And I thought that's what makes your version of this. And it feels very congruent with the Bach. He high faith. Baha'i. Baha yeah, close, almost, yeah. Uh, of, of sort of taking a more inclusive view, being yeah. open to things. Well, talking about life after death, that, that was something that we wanted to do early on when we started our YouTube channel is death is one of my very favorite topics. I love to talk about it. You know, there's that famous Native American phrase. I don't know what tribe would say it, but the, the warriors would get up and every morning they would say, today is a good day to die. Right. That they were at peace with their inevitable death. Um, the, uh, I knew that we had an opportunity to look at death in a way that was not being covered in the media in any way, shape, or form. So a young filmmaker named Justin Baldoni, who's also an actor, great friend, he had this idea for a show called My Last Days. And it's lessons in how to live from people who are dealing with terminal illness people in their last days of their life, how do we learn to appreciate what we have and what we do from people that are about to kick it? And the show is absolutely gorgeous. It was a huge runaway hit. Every single video that we made of My Last Days has hundreds of thousands of views, many of them millions or tens of millions of views. This is a topic that people want to explore. And we had countless people, Tom, writing into Soul Pancake and saying, every morning I watch a My Last Days video because it inspires me to keep my life in perspective. This life is a precious gift. Every day, every breath we take in our lungs is a gift. We've got a limited number of heartbeats. And eventually this thing is going to stop ticking. So how do we maximize who we are in those heartbeats that we have been allotted. And so you say why, and for me, why has to do with purpose. And I personally believe, after a, a long and difficult life with a lot of ups and downs and, and failures and hitting my head and getting lost, that uh, the greatest purpose that we can have as humans, 
separate from the monkey stuff that we do, is to be of service to other people. And that's where we find the greatest actual happiness, joy, contentment, not ephemeral happiness that comes from eating a cotton candy, but something more lasting. And it's kind of antithetical to what you would think. You'd think like, well, if I focus on myself and my own goals and, and what I need and, and what I want, and if I satisfy those things, then I will be happy. It's crazy, but scientists have found and psychologists have found that it's actually the opposite is true. The more you focus on making other people happy, challenging other people, uplifting other people, inspiring, being of service to other people, that's when you find in your life uh, that rich contentment percolating away. Do you ever look at stuff like that from an evolutionary perspective as to what makes that valuable? Because I think it's incredibly valuable. And one of the things we look for in any employee at Quest, we were just talking about this, uh, ambition, drive, and compassion, which is that sort of yeah. third unique thing that makes us Quest, is that we want to be of service to other people. We want to be of service to each other. Um, do you think there's a sort of animalistic utility in that? Personally, I view from my own belief system that we have an animal nature and we have a divine nature. Let's just call it that. And that compassion and service and beauty and truth, these are all aspects of our uh, higher nature. And for us as a species on this planet, we've got to leave this, uh, the, the monkey nature behind and move, and move forward uh, with this other aspect of, of who we are. Right. And um, you know, from global warming to you know, regional conflicts, um, to uh, racial prejudice, uh, prejudice against people that are different than us in any way, shape, or form, the subjugation of women. There's billions of women being subjugated across the planet and held in a near slavery status that we have to release mankind from these bondages to really go to other planets, to you know, be able to travel the stars and maximize who we are as, as beings of light. Only action speaks to me, so I want to stop you there. Mm -hmm. You, what you just said, that you want to make a difference in these very lofty, the treatment of women, come on, are you ever going to do anything? But you are. Um, talk to us a little bit about what you're doing in Haiti. Such a powerful quote, if I can steal a bit of your thunder. Uh, it gave me the chills, I wrote it down, I was like, holy Lord, this is amazing. So, uh, you'll explain the Lide Foundation in a minute, but you said, Giving women access to the arts is giving them a sense of self-worth mm -hmm. or, or, or that they matter even better, that they mm -hmm. matter. And I was like, whoa, the, because for me as a kid, that I was terrible at sports. So I gravitated to the arts and it made me feel like I matter. I may not be a young Haitian girl, but it was still a very empowering lesson for me. Tell us about the foundation, why you got involved and why you think it's so important. So my wife and I went down to Haiti. I'm on the board of a, an educational charity called the Mona Foundation, and we visited some of the schools in Haiti. We really fell in love with the country, just love the people and the, the life, the vitality of it. Yes, it's a very sick place in a lot of ways. It's very poor, it's very broken in a lot of ways, but it's, there's so much life there. I don't know how, how else to put it. We fell in love with the culture, and uh, we just kept wanting to go back and then the earthquake happened you guys were there like two weeks before or something yeah right? two two months before the earthquake wow. and the hotel we stayed at was completely obliterated everyone inside was killed Three hundred thousand people died in about 45 seconds wow. i mean it's it's as as poor a place as it was when we went before the earthquake to think about the devastation afterwards was it was unfathomable so we got this opportunity to teach the arts at this tent camp run by at Sean Penn's charity, which is an amazing charity, JPHRO. What Sean Penn has done to transform a whole section of the capital city of, of Port-au-Prince is incredible. So we started teaching the arts to these adolescent girls that lived in these tent camps because everyone was living in tents at the time. And I was so skeptical. I was like, come on, why are we going to teach photography and drama and creative writing to these girls they need shoes you know they need jobs they need you know umbrellas i don't know <laughs> they need practical yeah. things right but the transformation they took this group of people over that two-week period was astonishing and made our jaws drop 
And one of the exercises we did is we said to a young girl, like, we said, oh, there's a uh, getting to know you exercise. What's your favorite color? And it was obvious these girls had never been asked that question before. That's crazy. Because no one values culturally, I won't say no one, it's rare for anyone to value their opinion or their taste or who they are. So, so who they are doesn't matter in a way. That's kind of what they're told. Women do all the work in Haiti. They get up early from starting at age eight or nine years old. They fetch the water, they cook the fire, they raise the children, they sell in the markets, they work the fields, they do all the cleaning, all the childcare, and they're the last priority in terms of education. So here we saw this really underserved population. And after doing some research, realized, and the United Nations has recently come out with this, you want to end poverty? You want, you want something practical take away, Tom? Yes, you want please. to end poverty in the world? There's a billion people going to bed hungry every night. The number one way to end poverty in the world is to educate women and girls. Educate teenage girls, and that's how you eradicate poverty. Why? Because teenage girls spread what they learn. So you teach them to read, they're going to teach their kids, their sisters, their cousins, their neighbors, their moms, their aunts, their uncles, everyone. You teach a young dude how to read, I always say this, he's going to go and become an Uber driver. You know, he's not, he's not going to share it. He's going to be like, how can I make some money now? Right. You know, so, and it really uplifts community on a community level. So we saw the arts as a tool to get young girls to believe in themselves so that they could begin their educational journey. Why? Because I hate seeing people in poverty. And, and this has been proven. And, and we now, Lide Foundation uh, and Lide Haiti serves almost 500 girls in about six or seven locations. We're in really remote parts of Haiti and we provide scholarships. And that's part of our, that's part of our mission. Wow, it's really incredible and it shows what can happen with action and there's just some incredibly touching stories that you guys have around that. It's really breathtaking. I can't wait to see. I know you guys have started raising money now for the foundation, which will hopefully let it continue to grow and thrive. Uh, yeah. Really excited to see what you guys do with that. It's amazing. That's my big frustration. A lot of people dream, a lot of people talk, not a lot of people execute. Uh, so mm -hmm. you definitely have my admiration for executing. You talk a lot about um, the power of asking the big questions, of dealing with it. What are the, the most important questions to ask and answer to guide your daily life? Even though it is a daily life, mm -hmm. you have to live each day as a precious gift and I believe that each day is reflected best in the largest questions. Why am I here? What happens to me when I die? Um, what is the nature of love? Is love just a, uh, is it just a chemical reaction that's put in that? place for breeding? What do I think about that? Yeah, do you think it is just a chemical? No, I think that love transcends. I think the, uh, you know, I don't want to get all I don't want to get all spiritual on your ass here, Tom. And, you know, you're talking a lot of, uh, of, of business and self-actualization, but you can't prove your love in a laboratory. Yeah, you can find certain synapses lighting up and brain scans, but that my experience, like when my son was born and my wife and my son almost died in that birth process, Ooh. and it was, it was absolutely uh, devastating and the, and the hardest 24 hours of my life, and then when I finally held my beautiful, healthy son in my hands and I felt that just insane love like I had never known before, like on a cellular level, like no one can tell me that that's just a neurological impulses guided by a bunch of chemicals. I think that love is more, but some may not. It doesn't really matter. What really matters is what you do. It's not really what you believe, it's what you do. So by asking the life's big questions on a daily basis. It allows you to make decisions and actually do things. I know it sounds highfalutin, but <laughs> what the um, hell? Well, I'll, I'll bring it um, together with a quote here that I was hoping you'd, you'd give me occasion to use. I was going through Soul Pancake, the book, uh, and this quote is, is incredibly powerful to me. I will never forget it. Um, he who can no longer pause to wonder and stand wrapped in awe is as good as dead. His eyes are closed. And that's Albert Einstein. Um, that, that's powerful shit, man. Like when you're talking about holding your, you know, your child after this terrifying experience and then feeling this like just overwhelming sense mm -hmm. of awe and joy, uh, 
that that that's the juice. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's the juice. That to me is what we're chasing, right? I don't care. Honestly, I don't care so much about what the the reason that we have, the brain wiring structure that we have. I'm just interested in dealing with the world the way that it is. Yeah. Um, and it is that way. And it does it feels like taking drugs. Like my wife, oh my God. When I met her, I became delusional. I might as well have been doing cocaine. Like I just wanted to be with that woman. We've been together 15 years, married for 13. Just, I get it, you know, on a chemical level, how you yeah. can be so compelled to do something and finding ways to understand that you're being propelled through this world. That interests me. Okay, I'm being propelled through this world. You were propelled in that moment with your child, right? You're like, I'm gonna protect this mm. fucking child, mm -hmm. right? You're propelled to do that. I love my wife. I'm propelled to protect her, to do great things for her. You know, the empire that I'm trying to build, that I am not in any way, shape or form ashamed, that I'm trying to build an empire is in large part, I just want to impress that woman. Like I want to do something awesome for that woman. And understanding those compulsions, the desire to be great, to move through this world in a way that accomplishes something that you can look back at and say, that's great. Like that to me is tapping in. And, and what I found so fascinating researching you and I knew, I didn't even know the word Baha'i before I started getting into your world. Um, and it's really interesting to me, the sense of inclusion that it has, because that to me is, is just, the world is the way that it is. And now what nuggets of wisdom and usefulness can we glean from that beauty? What can we glean from that? Uh, yeah, I found that just cool. incredibly, incredibly useful. Yeah, I think, you know, my faith is really important to me, but most, most importantly is what my faith has led me to do, which is to dig deep and find out what it means to be a human being and then try and take what I've learned and share that with others. That's the question. What does it mean to be a human being? Um, what does it mean to be? I don't know. You guys have any ideas? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I have some personal ideas, but that's what we try and do too, is like, we at Soul Pancake don't have the answers. Right. I mean, I have an answer that works for me. I'm not gonna try and shove that down anybody's throat. Um, I'd love it if you walk us through because so for full disclosure, when you go on Soul Pancake, you're going to realize very, very quickly how even handed they are, how, hey, we don't have the answers. We have a love of the question. It gives people breathing room, which mm -hmm. I love mm -hmm. and is totally devoid of the sort of hippy dippy, your words, uh, spirituality that normally comes out. And I think it's great. And I think being selfish, I would love to hear what that means to you. What does it mean to be a human? Uh, You've hit on a lot of it. I think it means to love deeply, to view each day as a fucking miracle. I took my son uh, to the uh, Natural History Museum in uh, New York City a couple weeks ago, and we saw that incredible, Neil deGrasse Tyson narrates the incredible like birth of the universe and the Big Bang, you're kind of laying back and watching it, and it, it is, it's a really, moving, beautiful piece of work to be go floating through the galaxies and watching how the universe expand and explodes and realizing the size of this thing that we're living in. And sometimes we live our entire lives, our entire days like this. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, uh. And uh, to take that in and, that sounds really cliche, I sound like Oprah now. A white Oprah, listen to me, with a beard. Like there Oprah with a beard <laughs> and a dad bod. Um, I feel so self-conscious. I'm so buff here. Want to carb it up, huh? Pound some carbs. Um, see, I deflect when. Yeah, they need carbs. <laughs> you hear that? They're like, you, please. You need to give them some carbs. Can we? Can we have a pasta okay? day? <laughs> We went a pasta bar. I love, they were actually too weak to clap, right? Yeah. Please. And like, <laughs> uh, see, now I've forgotten the question. Because this was too hard of a question. What have I learned? Life is a miracle. Yeah. I've been, oh, oh man. What else? Um, th that's all I got. I'm that's sorry. That's pretty damn good. I was okay. like, man, if this guy's got even more, I'm, I'm going to write all yeah, this down. Yeah, I need to write this stuff down. I need to think it through a little bit more. I'm not so sure about that. Uh, 
everything you just said is incredibly powerful because it it's about capturing the moment, right? So um, my last days, the series that you guys are doing really is it, it's so interesting. So they talk a lot at Soul Pancake, talk a lot about authenticity, your own voice. It's one of the reasons I was so excited to have you on is um, your whole motto was build the thing that's really you. And the people that are really into that, who are like-minded, they're going to come and then just be true to that. That to me is the social revolution. That is what social media brought. It gave people the ability to say, this is me, man. This is when I feel my most passionate, my most alive, which is the most beautiful gift that somebody can have for themselves. And I forget if it was Ralph Waldo Emerson, somebody said the greatest gift for anybody is to be yourself. That's so fucking true. Mm -hmm. Like the greatest gift that you could possibly ever get is to really be yourself, mm -hmm. right? To really be into the things you're into, celebrate it, not feel embarrassed or made fun of for it. Like, this is what I love. I'm going all in and that's it. Everyone else can fuck off. And that is literally the shift in my mind that we had to make when we went from building a company that's purely based on profit to saying, I believe in this. And if it works as a business, that's really gonna be cool. Mm -hmm. But if it doesn't, I get to be me. I get to be me for the first time in my life unadulterated, unapologetically, I get to be me. And that that is such a good feeling. And it just is, I could live my life like that. And the thing my partners and I said to each other was, what would we do that we know we will love even if we're failing, right? Failing only sucks if you think it sucks. If you're failing and believing in yourself more and more every day, if you're failing and becoming a stronger person, if you're failing and because of that failure, you stop making stupid choices. Like when you failed at the play in London, London Assurance. Assurance yep. When you failed at that, everybody else in that position crumbles emotionally. They're destroyed. They call to their wife. They weep in the middle of the night and they do nothing about it. You fired your agents. You started over and you said, I'm never again not going to be me. Yeah. You've got to learn from your failures and you've got to have failures to learn from your failures. Those are going to be your greatest uh, growth experiences. And uh, when I did that play London Assurance in New York, I was out of acting school and really struggling with this idea of what it was to be an actor and to comb my hair and wear a nice buttoned shirt and, and you know, be this actor. And I did this play. I was first play on Broadway. I was cast in a lead play on Broadway and I was just out of school for a couple of years and, and I, was, I was really excited and I sucked and I was terrible. And I got bad reviews and I knew and I was stuck and I was lost and I was in over my head and I'd put all this pressure on myself to try and impress other people and to look good for other people and I wanted the good reviews and I wanted, I wanted success and it, it, it froze me as an artist completely. I, I was looked like a deer in the headlights through the entire process and I would, I would spend hours on the phone with my wife and I would talk to her every night weeping on the phone, how do I get through this? And I did, I, I got through that and it was revolutionary for me. I fired my agents, um, I went out on the street, I saw myself as a different person. I said, you know what, fuck it. I'm never again gonna try and be what anyone else wants me to be. That's it, I am done with that. That way is death. I have to be me, I'm gonna do things my own way and you can, you can know that, you can be told that, you have to experience that in your body and just like, Ugh, I'm done with that. Right. And so then I, that's when doors started opening for me. You know, that's when I started getting acting roles and, and having a great career. It led to me doing The Office and, you know, breaking the rules and, you know, going into an audition, not giving a shit and not even showering that morning and, <laughs> you know, and just being as weird as I naturally am. and letting my freak flag fly and uh, <laughs> as they said in the 70s and uh, that's it's opened up so many different things for me but it was months of hell sir tom sir. months of hell you can relate uh, i very much can relate and curling up in a ball with my wife and and saying i, I literally i've asked you to follow me and i have led us nowhere like mm -hmm. and and being just truly emotionally distraught and not knowing what to do uh, is is brutal and the irony is there's only one answer be yourself because then at least if it sucks you're gonna have a good time while it sucks right so I'm being authentically myself I'm not pretending to be somebody and losing like yeah. that's when it's not fun yeah um, and people sense authenticity and honestly I, I've never tracked back to figure out why but we all do respond 
so viscerally to authenticity and you know talking earlier about the social revolution the social revolution allows us to be rewarded for being authentic right so yeah that's a great way to put it you know when i was a kid there were three tv channels and there were like five movie studios and any kind of media that you wanted any kind of entertainment that you wanted came to us from those entities and that was it there was nothing else Nowadays, look at the landscape, look at the democratization of entertainment and of information. And the internet has provided this, but there's countless cable channels and online channels, and there's this YouTube channel. And you can uh, really express yourself. And there are so many more venues for people to become a tastemaker and a change agent in the world. So the tools are all here. Now we need to take all of these tools and tools of entertainment, tools of dispersal of information, and we u- need to use them to make the world a better place. Because I do think that you can get overwhelmed and be like, oh, the world sucks, and like you said, oh, that's grandiose, thinking about making the world a better place. But you know, we gotta start somewhere, and you, you start locally, and it'll filter through globally. I'm gonna get Oprah on your ass again, and I'm gonna say, she has a great quote by this guy, Reverend Howard Thurman, and he says, Find what it is that makes you come alive and do that. The world needs more people that have come alive. So I think that's what our mission-driven company, Soul Pancake, is trying to do, and your mission-driven company, which is far more successful and lucrative, Quest (laughs) is doing, uh, trying to make people come alive through, through ideas. It's literally true. Yeah. Uh, another show that really, I think, speaks to the soul of your brand, Kid President, which is just a smash hit for you guys. How did you... <laughs> if you guys... See, you need one of those guys that right? like The Tonight Show has that yeah. goes like... <laughs> yes, very true. Kid President. Kid President. Uh, the kid is amazing. How did you amazing. find him? This came from one of our consultations at, show, at Soul Pancake, uh, the co-founder... Devin Gundry said, you know, what we need on our channel, we need more joy. Like, wow, that's interesting. How do you, how do you put joy on a YouTube channel? <laughs> so we talked about it and Bobby Miller, our channel manager in our first years, he kind of said, you know, let me show you something. I stumbled across this video of this kid, this little African-American kid from Tennessee who uh, was pretending to be the president and did this little sketch with a little cardboard desk and a little handmade Oval Office. And it was, a, it was a silly, fun, but kind of a dumb video. Right. And we were like, holy moly, this is incredible. This kid is so dynamic. Yeah. And the idea is so great. And it's, it hasn't been actualized yet, but there's an idea here of an inspirational kid who's president for all kids, but a message for adults told from kids. And it just put a smile on our faces immediately. So we called him and that's when we started and uh, it really took off. I don't know how many tens or hundreds of millions the, the, kid, uh, the kid president, it's, uh, yeah, it's over a hundred million views, I believe. And we did, we brought joy to our channel and we brought joy to millions of people's lives. And not with any agenda whatsoever, but just to make people feel good. And, but we've done some great campaigns with kid president. That's impressive. Yeah. Very cool. It's a great campaign. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm going to now uh, flip the tables on you as a uh, avid consumer of metaphysical milkshake. I know that you have a certain set of questions that you ask people, so I'm going to flip them on you. Oh, my God. If you could go anywhere right now, where would you go? Cuba. Cuba. Okay. Uh, All right. It just opened up. It's incredible. But uh, five years from now, it's going to be a totally different country. you got to go now. All right. Yeah. Uh, what is one thing you know for sure? I love my wife and son. Okay, good one. What's one thing you learned that blew your mind? Um, That more people die from coconuts falling off of trees than shark attacks per year. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, that was for courtesy of my son who's 10 years old. All right. You know, they're they're the fountains of information. They're 10 year olds. Dad, did you know that two people a year in the United States die from shark attacks? But 27 from falling coconuts. 
I He's see like a little pancake Dwight. Pancake show coming. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, wh- how has your sense of right and wrong evolved? Right and wrong uh, evolves according to Lawrence Kohlberg's study of uh, moral uh, hierarchies. He was a Harvard professor who studied morality. It's a fascinating study if you look at where morality starts with kids and like they do something or don't do something if they think they're gonna get in trouble and then it evolves and like what can I get away with and then you start to do right and wrong because it reverberates um, uh, across the, the idea of justice or social justice. What's right and wrong for everyone. So you, you, you try and not speed because generally in our culture, the world is better if people stay to certain traffic laws. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it, everything will function better if we, if we all decide on what those traffic laws are and obey them as a culture. So that would be a higher level of kind of moral aptitude. And so I'm striving for that. It used to be like, what can I get away with? And I don't want to get caught and I don't want to get busted for what I'm doing right now, which could land me in jail. All right, what movie taught you the most about life? Apocalypse Now. Jesus, what it teach you? Just, uh, I love it. No, no movie goes into the dark side of humanity better and more effectively than Apocalypse Now. I don't even quite understand what they are, but that stuff with uh, Martin Sheen and Marlon Brando at the end is absolutely mesmerizing for me. Yeah, that movie is amazing. I actually used to teach that movie when I was teaching film. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah my great, favorite film. I love it. Great movie. Um, what album blew your mind? Uh, Radiohead, OK Computer. That's right. You saw them three times in one summer, right? I recently. You what stalker? Come on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wait yeah. till you see the photos I took of you while you were oh. there. That's when it starts to get creepy. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I love Radiohead, and, and when I first heard that album, I didn't know that you could have big ideas and beautiful melodies and, and transcendent musical experiences and orchestrations that was so plaintive and, uh, and, and, and complex. And it's like a, and I had to listen to it over and over and over and over and over and over again to try and unravel it. I still haven't figured it out. All right, of the, I believe, six steps we'll call them to eudaimonia which one is the most important the six steps to eudaimonia yeah from your usc speech yeah it's six uh, was it really you can look on that cheat sheet if you want <laughs> um boom four attitude of gratitude okay thank you thanks <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to leave you hanging Gratitude, it has been proven scientifically, again, through sociological and psychological studies, that living in gratitude is, has the best effect on your daily life. So you talked about making a decision, what can I do today to improve my life today? Start out with a gratitude list. Start out, wake up, open your eyes, and look around, and decide what you're grateful for. It's so easy, and our culture wants us to live in what we don't have, and like, oh, we don't have those shoes and we don't have Kim Kardashian's butt and we don't have his <laughs> money. But to look at what we have and um, several times a day, I really try and focus on what I have and, and what is good. And it, it, it lifts my spirit and it keeps me looking uh, toward the positive and focusing on the positive and moving forward in a positive way. Cool. I hope people heard you because that is amazingly powerful. Rain, I cannot thank you enough. For yeah, being on thanks, Tom. Yeah, great. You are a lot of fun. Great. Guys, thank you so much for joining us today with Rain Wilson. This dude is a deep thinker. What an amazing time. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. It is a weekly show. I am trying desperately to bring you other people who are as incredible as this man. So be sure to subscribe right here. You can find us at, at InsideQuest. You can find us at InsideQuest.com. You can find me at, at Tom Billu, And then Rain is going to tell you where you can find him. At Rain Wilson. Yeah, or at the In-N-Out Burger in Tarzana. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. That's it for this week. Thank you for joining us. Great. All right. All right. Great. Thanks. Being yourself helped you become successful. How have you been able to maintain that? 
through this long process, your long career? Well, I haven't always been able to maintain it. I've lost it a lot. One thing that was really important to me when The Office started taking off is I really wanted a movie career. And I really wanted my movies to work. And it seemed like every movie that I did just bombed. You know, did The Last Mimsy, The Rocker, Super. No one went and saw those movies. And it was devastating for me. It was really hard. I wanted to have that career. And there's nothing wrong with me wanting to have a successful movie career, but it became a point of obsession in my life.